um, that the plugs are going in around 90% from left main to LED. And this is explanation for, for the point that in majority of cases, we place stand from left main to LED because uh, going to the behind the plug. And in around 66% uh, of cases, plug is going to sell to uh, sell uh, LCX. And what is really very important is the diameter of the left main. In 75% of the cases, the left main diameter is something around 4.0, even up to 5.75 millimeters. So we need definitely to use uh, adequate uh, size stands. And this is, in, uh, I think, very important um, to, to have uh, in every cath lab stands like uh, Onyx or um, uh, Synergy Megatron, which can go really up to six millimeters. So uh, we are waiting now for ABC main study. Maybe Goran will uh, make uh, some comment to this very important study uh, from Europe. And uh, this will be first really randomized comparison, single versus double stenting for um, this the left main stenosis. So Dicky Crash, you know um, uh, very nicely, many, many different uh, steps, but if you go really step by step, you can manage uh, left main bifurcation very nicely. Um, if you go to the more to the non-left main um, bifurcation lesions, we do now, uh, we started now the BBK3 trial to compare Culot with Dicky Crush. So um, we study around 1000 patients uh, after treatment with, um, um, with single or double stenting. And we have follow up for 10 years. And this is, you see, around 900 patients uh, with um, complete follow up for 10 years. Uh, 407, uh, 477 patients with single and 390 patients with double stenting. So, and this was our philosophy to try to stand um, uh, distal left man with one stent and final kissing. Final kissing is obligatory in our institution for left man PCI. And then bail out uh, modified uh, T stenting tap or culotte. So, in this registry, we don't have. Uh, Dicky crash, and you see, uh, the patients uh, were over 70 years old, and um, in around 25%, uh, uh, um, we had acute coronary syndrome patients. So we uh, followed up uh, the patients, and we saw here uh, that Medina 111 was more frequently found in the double stenting group and even true bifurcations high significantly were found in the double stenting group. And the, in how many cases we it, uh, use it TAP, we use it TAP in this patient's um, subset in 90% and 10% uh, culotte and fluoroscopy time, radiation exposure time were a bit higher uh, in double uh, stenting group. And now, um, so we had uh, serolimus uh, data, Texas data, Sotorolimus, Everolimus, and we had some um, um, biodegradable polymer uh, stands like Synergy and Os Os Osiro. So uh, how was uh, the, the follow up, the data for 10 years? And you see uh, death of all cause uh, around 25% and um, cardiac death, cardiac death, um, because you saw patients were definitely a bit older, cardiac death around 12 and 10% in uh, not, not significant between single and double stenting for this and left man. And uh, TLR, 17 versus 27. Uh, so this was significant, more frequent problems after double stenting and even MACE was um, significantly higher for double stenting. So if we just, Take a look to the couple of Maya curves. You see for four or five years, um, curves were practically identical. If we see um, death MI, uh, very similar curves. If we see TLR, 
you see, because initially we had a many uh, control coronary re-enter after six months, and then we found some problems. And uh, if this was corrected, you see during follow-up, the, the curves are going very parallel, very similar um, follow-up. Organizers, can you take uh, care? Uh, he is not audible. Dr. Ferring? Sir, he is not, not audible. Able. Yeah, he got disconnected. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He will be connecting back. Yeah. Looks like some network issue. You would coordinate with him. Jasmine, can you quickly check? Uh, looks like actually we lost connection uh, while the Dr. Miroslav comes back. Uh, uh, Goran, uh, let me ask you, do you think that all these patients in nowadays with uh, bifurcation, we need to have uh, IVUS uh, studies in everybody? You are muted, Goran. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. thanks. Uh, no, of course I don't. Uh, and uh, I, I don't believe it's uh, really necessary to use imaging in every bifurcation. For complex scenario, especially for the <laughs> earlier stage of career, uh, I do support, especially for the left main. But in regular practice, I don't think you gain much by using routinely imaging. And uh, if, you, if you have experience in imaging, actually your eye becomes IBUS trained so by using adequate size of balloons, adequate size of kissing balloon diameters, I don't think you can gain much by routine use in simple bifurcations of imaging. However, if you need lesion preparation, especially if there is calcium, I think there is advantage of using imaging. And especially for the left main, my personal advice, I don't have any data, but my personal advice is to suggest the routine use of imaging for left main PCI. Right, we are we're going to be waiting for the DK Crush uh, 8 uh, study for, from uh, Professor yes. Chen and yes. others uh, to see whether that there is truly a role for IVUS or imaging in uh, left main bifurcation. But until then, you recommend that if you're an expert, you probably can get away without imaging. Exactly. But if you're in the first uh, few years of uh, left main... In the uh, first 20 years, you need imaging after that. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, Very good point. Yes, Srinivas. The, yes, recent, uh, the recent ESC uh, article, uh, large multicenter trial was presented in which left main imaging was done with IVO. And what operators felt angiographically with the sizing and what came out, what was uh, analyzed in OCT and what was done later, there were 70% discrepancy in spite of experienced operators. So it's always uh, angiography. Uh, we might underestimate. I think this uh, point uh, needs to be kept in mind. Many times you also see post dilatation. Angiography wise, it doesn't appear more, but areas you keep calculating, the three dimensional, the whole circular areas wise, okay, area is now I see. So I yeah, think we have yeah. noted that many times. So I think uh, for the sake of uh, benefit, as Goranka, very experienced, it is different. And in general, also, when the Korea and Japan, where there is very high usage of uh, imaging, the TLR and the repeat uh, problems happening are much less than the European studies, percentage-wise, if you see. I think right. as a broad rule, uh, we cannot say that it is not uh, required at all. Right. So I think what but, is important is that the, 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 the uh, translation of the clinical event out right. of whether you are using image or image uh, 
device like IBAS or OCT in left main intervention or not. Obviously, if you are very experienced and if you are already used to IBAS and OCT, your eyes are well set. You know the exact sizing of balloon and stent, what Dr. Goran has clearly mentioned. But as Suniva said, I agree with you that most of us may not have that much experience. Therefore, for, for us, for, for, for us, maybe IBAS and OCT may be helpful. But what is important, we have to have a solid evidence to correlate the IVAS guided intervention versus without IVAS guided intervention in left main vis a vis a clinical sort of in a correlation of the event. It will come. Uh, That's right. Can I just add, we, yeah. we'll go, so go back to Dr. Dr. Miraslav. Dr. Miraslav. Yeah, Dr. Miraslav, are you ready? Yes, um, the, Chris, I'm sorry, I lost here. Uh, no, no, no. How, what can I do about this? Yeah. Please start. Uh, we were waiting. Uh, I don't know uh, where was uh, where I was. Um, which part did you did you did you um, not see? Did you see you the were, Kaplan Meyer curves? Yeah, yeah, Kaplan yeah, we Meyer. Were, we were talking about TLR, forty-two percent, the BBK ten-year experience, and where we left you, you were talking about TLR, forty-two percent with two stand strategy and thirty-two point one percent. With uh, that uh, curve we were showing, you know, TLR. You talked you about the Kaplan Meyer curves. Yeah, yeah, Kaplan Meyer we show. You can show it once more. Very interesting, yeah. To see the 10 year results, yeah. So, um, <laughs> share your screen, Miraslav. We can't see your yeah. screen. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um... And uh, go on to like a slideshow so that actually yeah. that uh, slide will be much bigger. Thank you. Yeah, can yeah, you put so on sli a slideshow, please? Yeah, that's okay. very good. Yeah. Thank no, you. No, no, very good, yeah. Can you see now the slides? Yeah, so, yeah, um, beautiful. The, the, the topic was very clear. If we just go with, um, with um, landmark analysis, so you can see um, the maze after one year was definitely practically identical Kaplan-Meier curves over the next nine years. And the only problem was uh, uh, regarding TLR. So it was uh, just significant difference um, with P0.04. And even for death and I and uh, death, there was even some sign for benefit for double stenting, maybe as a, as a uh, effect of uh, complete revascularization. And uh, we also uh, has uh, taken a look to the uh, to compare stands first versus second generation DS. So death is uh, very similar, practic practically uh, very uh, similar between first and second generation death and I. The same situation. Uh, TLR practically over nine years very similar uh, results, not significant, and maze. Uh, the same, um, the same um, slide, and very, very uh, good data is also to uh, stent thrombosis. So let let's say uh, the stent thrombosis can occur very early, and um, definite probable stent thrombosis during late follow up after left main stenting is extremely um, rare. Uh, practically no case in our registry data with around 900 patients after PCI for a distal left main uh, stenosis. So how we plan in our cath lab with, um, to go forward with uh, distal left main, I would recommend to go with seven French. It's better than six French. You have more options to use bigger balloons for kissing, etc. Uh, definitely you need uh, extra backup uh, guidings. Uh, you have to wire definitely both branches if there is complex bifurcation stenosis, always predilate, predilate both branches. And I think if you see a lot of calcium, the um, lesion preparation using rotablation is now more and more important um, for, the, for the lesion preparation. And strategy, try to go with one single stand, final keys and pot. If the anatomy is primary, very complex, you can definitely plan either decay crush. Uh, so you have to go definitely always with two stands 
or culot or tap, then you have option to go by provisional approach. This is possible. And definitely stent postulatation with NC balloons, final pot is definitely uh, obligatory. One important point is if you go with uh, Onyx, you can make a very nice um, side branch um, uh, access to, to, to the circ, and you can go up to six millimeters. So we, um, in our cat lab, is definitely preferred stand for a left man. So if you, if you stand uh, left man with one stand, so you're fine. If you have dissection in the side branch, if you have residual stenosis more than 75% or timi flow below two, then you can go with a double stenting. And um, what, from my perspective, is really very important to, to for younger doctors to perform a final pot. Final pot, uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the um, most important points, I hope, hope uh, Goran uh, will agree with me, most important uh, technical points to really um, uh, improve our results and to improve technical approaches to make PCI in bifurcations uh, much easier. So this uh, was very, very helpful to avoid malapposition. And uh, finally, uh, so even regarding the bifurcation treatment and this development, we um, have now more, more and more um, robust data showing that if we have really relevant side branch stenosis and side branch diameter more than 2.5 millimeters, so we have through bifurcation a lesion. And uh, if we have complex through bifurcation lesions, including this selectment, so we can really, there is a quite good data now from um, Dickey Crush 3 and 5, very good data from large randomized trials uh, from China um, that double stenting primary is uh, achieving um, really uh, better results. So we can go here in this part with primary with um, uh, double stenting. Um, and uh, in non-complex in non through bifurcation lesions, there is even equivalent evidence for single or double stenting. And if we have here non through bifurcation lesions, uh, so uh, there is uh, evidence for benefit of provisional, provisional one stand strategy and no new evidence uh, with contemporary stents or stenting techniques. And for trivial, trivial bifurcation lesions, so there, was, there are no dedicated studies available. And so uh, we can, um, side branch intervention should be performed only as uh, bail uh, out. So um, I think this is exactly one of the cases which we have done in this year with a rotablation and um, with um, hemodynamic support. So uh, in conclusion, uh, dear friends, compare it with the single stenting, double stenting <laughs> was associated with a significantly higher long-term risk of MACE. MACE was increased, the higher incidence of TLR, whereas the risk of death, MI or stent thrombosis was similar. And after first critical year, the MACE during long-term follow-up was similar between single and double stenting. And uh, there was a no significant difference between first and second generation of DES. And uh, we are waiting now for results of our ABC main study, uh, which will be presented very soon. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Miroslav Fering, for your excellent speech. And we could know about many of the recent uh, developments in Europe regarding the 10-year BVK results, and you have shown beautifully. And I really appreciate some of your comments, like uh, you have shown that regarding the side branch intervention, you have not mentioned about FFR because everybody gives so much importance, but this is very practical what you have showed, that if the stenosis is more than 75%, percent in the side branch or there is timid to flow and another indication because sometimes of course we go for physiological assessment 
by doing FFR. But in eight randomized trials, there was a lot of discrepancy and there was no uniformity regarding the definition of site branch optimi optimization. So what is your opinion about that? What is the, so we, what, how have you defined in EBC trial the site branch optimization? This, the site in ABC um, trial, we in ABC main, uh, it was definitely uh, recommended to perform in the single uh, study arm, it was recommended to perform final keysync. And regarding the double uh, stenting technique, it was uh, free to uh, the operator's decision which uh, type of uh, technique uh, can should be used. So um, we will see how is. The data um, from my center, we um, uh, could uh, randomize more than 30 patients. Uh, I think uh, the majority of cases was two thirds was culotte uh, and um, one third was dicky crush um, in, in, from our center. We, regarding FFR uh, measurement, so we, um, I believe if you have borderline situation with uh, side branch, whatever it is, LAD or mostly um, uh, CERC, uh, then you can, um, you can definitely perform uh, FFR measurement if you have available tools in your care, but uh, you should know um, this is sometimes not so easy and uh, you, you have to to take care if you have uh, struts in the left man, if you rewire whatever would you do, you have to take care not to provoke shortening or some uh, stent struts uh, uh, deformation. Um, but we do this sometimes sporadically, we do, but uh, now more and more, as I showed in my last slide, uh, more and more we go to the decision if we have complex bifurcation lesions in the distal left man, then we go complex. Then we go either with dicky crush or culotte uh, sporadically with step. This is our approach in our center. Excellent, excellent. Dr. P.K. Dev there, have you got any comments, Dr. Dev? Dr. P.K. Dev? Dr. Anjan Dotto? Dr. Anjan Lal Dotto? Okay, now the session is open for comments. Ramesh is there, Ramesh? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, Ramesh, yeah. Card. Any comments, Ramesh? What is your opinion? Yeah, so, uh, so the opinion is that actually now, even though we try to do left main stenting and uh, we think it is uh, better than uh, uh, cabbage and uh, bypass surgery in some group of patients, uh, I still think, especially with the Excel, I want to ask you, Dr. Miroslav, Frank, uh, with Excel and while you're awaiting for EBC main, how confident are we to suggest that uh, on long term, that left main stenting is going to be superior uh, to CABG or even uh, non-inferior with the Excel yeah, study yeah. in mind? Yeah. Hi, Ramesh. Uh, what we what we should show uh, primary, and this is from from my point of view the most important point, we should show that we are not wor worse than cabbage, but definitely we are less invasive compared to cabbage, right? And if we have uh, this left man and we can. Uh, treat the patients using um, PCI at least at the same level like surgery guys with the same long term clinical long term follow up results. So I for me it will be uh, will be fine. You know, um, don't forget now for for the first time we have better stands. So uh, the data I show it this was still um, all the first and second generation of um, DES. And now we, we still have now, I believe more experience. We do better job. Uh, we have better stands. Uh, we use more um, imaging in cases, uh, if we are not 100% sure, then we have to check the result, acute result 
with uh, imaging and to, to improve the result, to correct the result. So I think um, we are less invasive, that's clear, but we should be at least similar uh, like cabbage according to the long-term follow-up to the clinical results. Sir, uh, what is your experience uh, regarding the side branch treatment with TAP? The TLR was shown to be previously 5% because 90% of the patient in two-stain strategy, you have done 90% of the cases by TAP and 10% by Kulot. So what is the TLR in uh, two-stain strategy in TAP technique in your study? Because it's a very was, interesting... Uh, yeah, there was not significant uh, difference between um, between culotte and tap regarding clinical follow-up. So we don't have um, we don't have QCA analysis for these patients. Um, so there was uh, practically from um, a clinical point of view, TLR was not significantly different between um, patients treated with tap and patients treated with culotte. So this was very similar. Um, you know, from the uh, DK crush uh, three uh, in the left main, DK crush was better. So in our, in our data, we don't have um, DK uh, crush. Thank you, sir. Robin, any comments? Robin? I have a question. Yeah, Dr. Khanna. Uh, I just yeah. wanted to know uh, what is your experience in left main standing vis a vis left ventricular dysfunction or a status of left ventricular function and uh, presence or absence of diabetes? Um, if you, sorry, the last uh, top. Uh, the presence and absence of diabetes uh, in your groups, uh, did it and make any difference uh, in uh, the outcomes of left main standing? And secondly, whether LV functions actually made any difference uh, in choosing between, uh, you know, CAVG and uh, left main standing. Yeah, uh, this was um, uh, not significantly different regarding LV function. And uh, we had diabetes patients were uh, in both groups similar around 28%, around 30%. And uh, so we didn't found here a uh, high significant difference between a single and double stenting uh, in, in patients uh, with um, distal left main stenosis. At I least think in those uh, patients upset. I think if you look at the literature uh, clearly, if you have left ventricular dysfunction, diabetes in the individual um, with comorbid condition, maybe the uh, CAVG would be a better option for a, for a long-term prognostic point of view rather than, uh, than catheter-based intervention like stenting. But I have to say, as uh, has already been mentioned, that with the newer technology, with the new, newer stent design, especially with the thin strut, uh, I'm sure that the left main stenting would be quite comparable, if not, uh, uh, I mean, certainly would be non-inferior, if not superior, to some of these a good number of cases of left main bifurcation lesions. But you have to wait. Because so far, there is no uh, study available with the newer technology and more uh, sort of IVAS imaging in left hand bi bifurcation. If you look at the Excel or even earlier Noble, all these trials, they have not incorporated all the cases who have been done by IVAS guided or image guided intervention, as well as with a newer technology, new generation of stent. With a, with a thinner start stent, maybe, maybe very special way of doing the procedure like nano crush, I'm sure that we will be um, we'll have much more confidence and much more positive outcome of left main bifurcation intervention. Thank you, Robin. Dr. Justin Paul, you have a very large experience in STEMI patients and in 15% of our patients during primary PCI, we get uh, some bifurcation lesion. So what is your comments? Anything you want to talk about that? Because we have got two, three stalwarts from the world. So what is your opinion regarding the STEMI patients with bifurcation? Dr. Justin Paul, are you there? Sorry, I think he is not connected. So 
I, I really appreciate one of the comments when Ferenczi was disconnected, but Goran, Goran told that if uh, that IVAS is not required in all the patients. I think uh, that is the experience, European experience and US also in 10 to 15% of the left main PCIs, we use IVAS. But of course it's better, but you know, because it involves cost and also it involves time. So I think always it's not, uh, you know, uh, not to, uh, good to use IVAS. But of course, in some situations, we have to use for better visualization. But in a country like India, I think uh, it's uh, better to go for, you know, uh, if possible, but otherwise we can go for angiographic result because all the data have shown, as Professor Ferenc has also shown, that we don't have to go always for the you know physiological testing for the side branch. And I think what he has done is internationally accepted. So thank you very much. So we uh, close this uh, session. Dr. Ferenc, you be with us because we need your vital comments. So we are uh, inviting Dr. Goran Stankovic, uh, left main PCI. What have we learned from visible heart? So Dr. Goran, please. Goran? Goran, you're muted, Goran. Yeah, now we can see the slides. Yeah. Hi, Goran. You're still, yeah. You're, you're still muted, Goran. Okay. Okay. Good. No. Is it okay now? Okay. Now we can hear you. Yeah. 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 So I hope you can see my slides as well. Uh, good afternoon again from Belgrade. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss with you uh, visible heart and the impact of visible heart experience on contemporary left main PCI practice. I don't have financial conflict of interest related to this presentation. And uh, to describe the visible heart, uh, I will use the words from the interview of Paul Yaizo a director of Visible Heart Lab at the University of Minnesota. And he said, Visible Heart Lab is the only place in the world where researchers can study beating hearts outside of the body. And here you can see this is a swine heart, perfused, resuscitated, defibrillated. So for at least eight hours, you can work on all coronary vessels and use multimodality imaging to evaluate uh, different stenting techniques, but also interventions in valves and uh, also in pulmonary uh, vasculature. Uh, here you can see a video from the last visit that I had with Dr. Pedro Gonçalves. It was last March. And we did uh, uh, multiple bifurcation stenting techniques. Uh, and you can see recording and collaboration between European Bifurcation Club, Metronic, and the University of Minnesota last since 2012. So we use multimodality, multimodality imaging, OCT, angioscopy, as you can see, to look from inside the heart. Uh, then we perform OCT at each of the steps of bifurcation stenting, and we try to combine uh, the uh, newest technology, but also we try to refine already existing techniques and we try to document the impact of specific recommendations that we as a European Bifurcation Club try to share once a year at our meetings. And here you can see the T-stenting, which is one of my personal favorite techniques because I still believe that uh, provisional as a philosophy, not provisional, as a single stand strategy, is still the way to go for majority of coronary lesions. So you can see here that uh, we are able, by using uh, visible heart, uh, to see different stenting techniques like proximal optimization technique, the impact of side branch access, distal versus proximal cell, the impact of kissing technique, 
type of balloon, pressure, sequence of inflations, and finally to evaluate final stand a position. So I will start by pointing to a couple of steps in provisional side brain stamping, which is according to the most recent European Bifurcation Club recommendations, and which were actually confirmed or developed thanks to cooperation between Metronic, Visible Heart Lab, and the EBC. And these are the known uh, steps of provisional, including provisional left main stenting. So our strategy is to always wire both branches. We routinely predilate the main vessel and side branch dilatation is left to operator decision. We don't say you should not do it, but we don't recommend routine predilatation because of the risk of dissections. And then after main vessel stenting, re-entering through one of those dissection planes. The next step after predilatation of the main vessel is to stent main vessel according to distal reference diameter and then perform proximal optimization technique. Thanks partially also to uh, visible heart lab experiments, but also some registry data which were already published. Today we promote POT as mandatory step for every bifurcation PCI technique, including uh, complex strategy, but especially for provisional, we believe that depending on the significance of the side branch, following the pot, we can always evaluate uh, the need for further intervention into the side branch. And in some cases, we can stop after performing proximal optimization. Optional procedure, op optional step for uh, provisional is kissing balloon inflation, but there is also alternative known as pot, kissing balloon inflation and repot. And of course, if we need second stand, then we need uh, to do mandatory kissing. And I will show some of the images from the visible heart, which convincingly document the necessity to perform proximal optimization. Why we perform proximal optimization? Uh, we know that bifurcations have fractal geometry and we always have step down in diameter from proximal part of the main vessel into distal part of the main vessel. And this discrepancy in diameters, of course, because of the uh, fractal law of Mare and Finet law, depend on the size of the side branch. The larger the side branch, the higher the discrepancy between proximal and distal part of the main vessel. So according to EBC, correct approach to stenting main vessel is to select stent according to distal main vessel diameter. We will decrease the likelihood of uh, carina shift, but we need to be aware that after stenting according to distal, there is huge under expansion in the proximal part of the main vessel. And also there is no side branch osteal scaffolding in case of distal reference. If we do the opposite, if we select stent according to proximal main vessel diameter, we don't think it's correct because we increase the risk for uh, carina shift and compromise of the ostium of the side branch. And here is angioscopy view. This is a wire in the main branch and this is inver inverted provisional stenting from the main vessel into the side branch. And you can clearly see that by inflating stent, which is undersized for the proximal part of the main vessel. We actually, before expanding stent, increase the likelihood of going, of going with the wire behind the stent, and we go inside the side branch completely uh, uh, outside of the main vessel stent. So if we do at this point OCT imaging inside the main vessel stent, you can clearly see gross under expansion in the proximal part of the main vessel and with reconstruction and stent optimization a position analysis, you see predominantly yellow and red struts with under expansion higher than 300 microns. Uh, POT does the correction and here is illustration of POT. So we select short, semi-compliant or non-compliant balloon and then uh, balloon size should be selected according to proximal main vessel diameter. And following balloon inflation, you will see that under expansion that was uh, very high is almost completely gone after first 
balloon inflation with adequately sized balloon, and we recommend uh, non-compliant balloons in most of the cases. But if we are uh, talking today about left main PCI, and if we stand from the ostium of the left main, we can use also compliant balloon. Compliant balloon will allow us by increasing the pressure inside the balloon to increase also diameter and to better a pole stand in highly fibrotic area at the ostium of the left main. And here is the result. So you see that after pot, you have a full position of the stent in the proximal part of the main vessel without compromising the distal part of the stent and without causing carina shift if we position the distal marker of the pot balloon proximal in front of the carina. And by performing OCT at this stage, we document also complete and full expansion of the stent and correction of previously seen malaposition. Next step is uh, rewiring. And for rewiring, we recommend to go in one of the distal cells. And why this is so important? Because the main difference in our view between T and TAT stenting is, uh, of course, the angulation of bifurcation, but also recrossing point. Because if we are able to recross distally, like in the left-hand side diagram, by inflating balloon at this point, we push some metal and we scaffold the roof, we scaffold the ostium of the side branch using the metal from the main vessel stand. And then when we use second stand to stand the side branch, we don't need to protrude much inside the main vessel stand. And we are actually able to fully cover the ostium of the side branch without creating metallic neocarina. It's the opposite in case that we cross proximal cell, like in this example here, because after inflation of balloon, we actually push these metallic struts inside and we create this short metallic neocarina and uh, we don't scaffold the ostium of the side branch. So when we go with stent inside the side branch, we need to pull back that stent, cover completely the ostium of the side branch. But as a result, as a consequence, we always have some amount of new metallic neocarina. And uh, uh, to correct the result of side branch balloon dilatation, we recommend to do final kissing. Final kissing, as you may see here, uh, in the overlap area in bifurcation polygon of confluence with short overlap actually better expands the stent in the main vessel. But the main additional value of the kissing is by simultaneous inflation of two balloons to position, as you may see here, to position carina in the center. And having central carina uh, position is extremely important because it serves as a flow divider. And when carina is in the center, we have a symmetrical distribution of blood to both vessels. However, the role of kissing according to available evidence is very important for two stand strategy because as you can see here, uh, provisional two stand strategies and available publications clearly demonstrate that in two stand strategy performance of kissing has positive impact on clinical outcome. However, in provisional side brain stenting strategy, we see positive impact of kissing in provisional only in COBIS-2 registry. And we have in COBIS-1 detrimental effect of kissing, negative impact on clinical outcome. But majority of studies, including randomized Nordic three studies, show neutral effect. So uh, we interpret this data uh, in the way that if we treat a large side branch bifurcation like the left main, we believe that the role of kissing is important to remove metal from the ostium of the side branch and also to position carina in the center. But specifically for the left main bifurcation, I personally believe that uh, opening access towards the side branch, towards the cirque, is very important for eventual disease progression in the future 
So in case that after certain period of time, there is disease progression in the one of the marginal or posterior lateral branches, we already have access. So my uh, personal approach is to uh, use systematically kissing for provision of stenting of the left main and some other large bifurcations, but for majority of bifurcations based on these neutral results, I don't routinely recommend kissing balloon inflation. Uh, the last thing in provisional, which is very important to comment, is the role of final pot. Final pot is uh, very important to correct oval shape deformation created by kissing and to better oppose proximal edge of the stand. However, if we go too deep, we actually shift in this case metal towards the ostium of the side branch and we actually compromise the side branch, not by carina, by, but by the metal from the main vessel stand. And I like this cartoon of uh, Dr. Jens Lassen who says, oops, it's too deep because you clearly see that too deep position of the final pot is uh, very dangerous and potentially uh, creates a shift of the metal and compromise of the ostium of the side branch. How do we correct it? We correct by repeating kiss and then more proximal report. So here is the cartoon that I made with my colleague, Dr. Mehmet Begovic, how according to EBC consensus, we should perform provisional nowadays. So wiring of both branches, predilatation, stenting of the main vessel, according to osteal LED diameter, post dilatation, proximal optimization, exchange of wires, kissing balloon inflation in the left main, and then final pot, but final pot with balloon far proximal from the carina side. And this is a fly-through uh, simulation. In this case, you can clearly see that by distal cell crossing, we actually keep carina in the center and we keep also broad access into the cell. And finally, I'll show you uh, how we use also visible heart possibilities to uh, refine contemporary two stand techniques. Uh, we were all surprised that uh, based on single study DK Crash 5, in the most recent European cons uh, uh, guidelines, we have recommendation of course, class 2B that in true bifurcation lesions of the left main DK crash may be preferred over provisional. So uh, we believe that there is some space for improvement, especially uh, because of the discrepancy in diameters of the balloon that is used to crush side branch stand. Uh, what I mean by this, if we select balloon size according to distal main vessel diameter, size of that balloon is not adequate to crush completely metal in the proximal part of the main vessel. So here is deployment of the stent into the cirque with some protrusion inside the left main. So next step is to remove the wire from the circumflex and then crush with balloon, which is sized according to a reference diameter of the OSTL LED and see what happens. Even if you go to very high pressure, diameter discrepancy does not permit full crushing of the uh, protruded segment. So you can clearly see that we don't crush completely stand from the cirque. And sometimes we will recross through the uh, same, through lumen of the stand instead uh, of crushing completely. So our suggestion was uh, to use balloon like for the pot, bigger balloon compared to the first ones to actually uh, do two steps of crushing stand from the side branch. And you will see that by using adequately sized like pot sized balloon in the proximal part, you see now that crushing of the stand protrusion is much better. So this will really allow you a better scaffolding of the ostium and recrossing through the proximal cell. So another second inflation uh, going to higher pressure. And you see that after removal of the balloon, you are really able by using uh, two different diameters of balloon 
to completely crush protruded segment. And here is our animation incorporating this step. So wires in both branches for decay crash, stent in the side branch, stent deployment, then post dilatation, removing wire, and then two step crushing. And after that, we go as traditionally do, first kissing, stenting in the main vessel, port to fully deploy stent in the main vessel, then recross, individual high pressure inflations, then simultaneous kissing and mandatory step pot at the end. In blue, you see stent from the side branch and you see now in fly through image that in DK crash, you actually have a nice coverage of the ostium, but with very uh, unpredictable direction of the crushed segment and with two step crash, you are able to completely remove the metal from the ostium of the side branch and have good coverage of the whole bifurcation. And as Dr. Ferrer said, uh, we are uh, still evaluating whether DK crash is the only technique of two stand strategy for the left main in our study EDC main. Actually, we are not comparing provisional with DK crash exclusively we let operator decide which two stand strategy we'll use in case of randomization. And for, for provisional, we recommend provisional according to steps which I previously described. And I'm really happy to share with you that December last year, we were able to complete our recruitment. And I congratulate the centers of excellence who really were top three best recruiters. And I'm happy to share with you that in February or March next, next year, so very soon from now, we will have preliminary results of the EDC May. So uh, Dr. Kahali, dear chairman, dear colleagues, uh, I would like to conclude that in my view, provisional side brain stenting should be recommended for majority of bifurcations, including left main, because it preserves my options. Stand technique should depend on individual patient's anatomical characteristics and the operator's skill. Port is the mandatory step for every left main bifurcation PCI, while kissing is optional for provisional and mandatory for two stand strategy. Among two stand strategies, there is currently strong randomized evidence for performing DK crash, while EBC main results are awaited. I would like to invite you to go to Metronic com bifurcation exploration website to look all the other techniques and all the other images which are uh, uh, collected by most of the experts from the European Bifurcation Club who had privilege to visit Visible Heart Lab. And I would like to thank, this is Paul Yazo and this is the great team from the Visible Heart Lab. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very, very much, Goran, for your superb, superb lecture. It was an excellent exposition of the subject and one of the best lectures we have heard ever. And especially you your much. and especially your comparison, uh, comparison to the you know living heart. This is unique. You know, we are seeing a new. Many of us are seeing new, and this is excellent from the lab, Minnesota lab, which you have shown. And also you have touched about the basics and uh, you have shown that uh, taking the main uh, branch tent according to the size of the distal vessel and that prevents the carina shape. You have uh, mentioned about all the how to preserve the you know, side branch. You have shown how in DK crash we go for the port price and in a systematic way. And all these are very important. And we should not jump in DK crash First of all, to the kissing, we should go for side branch inflation, then main branch inflation. And then while in kissing inflation, we should go for main branch inflation first when we dilate. And then we should start simultaneously, of course, but little after the main branch inflation. And regarding the balloon choice, you have also told about choosing the semi-compliant or non-compliant balloon, but not going for compliant balloon to you know, achieve our purpose and how important it is. And I have been watching meticulously in your Euro PCR teachings, which you periodically, yesterday also there was a posting from you. Thank that, you. <laughs> uh, you know, and I see very meticulously regarding the balloon positioning. 
and how you show during port how important it is to keep the balloon at the carina level and not to cross the side branch that distorts the side branch strain and i also learned from you that we are all favoring tap technique but how beautifully you have shown that uh, if we do tap how the inferior wall or inferior surface of the side branch main branch strain is deformed and that can cause some flow disturbances some eddy current some disturbance in the shear stress and also in future thrombosis formation and uh, one question to you that our mission has clearly shown that uh, dilating the while kissing balloon inflation kissing balloon twice is very helpful because by first inflation 53% of the metal is there in the side branch ostium but if we dilate for the second time the uh, you know amount of uh, uh, you know metal comes down to 25% that means almost 100% decrease and that prevents the eddy current and also future thrombosis of the side branch so what is your opinion regarding kissing balloon twice for the better visual better flow in the side branch yeah thank you very much first for the kind words but uh, what we learn is actually based on bench testing analysis and visible heart lab because uh, there is a, a high degree of recoil which we don't see on geographically so if we don't keep balloons inflated for at least 30 seconds then there is recoil of 30 to 40% so we need to keep balloons inflated for at least 30 seconds but the same result can be achieved by three shorter inflation so in case that it's left main that patient cannot tolerate yeah. you yeah. can inflate three times 10 seconds and achieve the same expansion and then we learn from John Ormiston long time ago that with two step kissing balloon inflation it's sequential inflation first we really remove much better metal from the ostium of the side branch so sequential kissing inflation starting by inflating side branch first then decreasing pressure in the side branch balloon increasing pressure in the main branch balloon and simultaneous deflation according to bench testing please these are bench testing data we don't have clinical evidence yeah. but we learn with all this that uh, what is not good in bench usually at some point of time confirms also harm in patients so we try to base our suggestions and to share based on the bench testing and i think the role of visible heart is really essential in this area and one thing i want to ask you goran after your beautiful speech that why you selected only onyx stent for ebc 450 patients that was the initial recruitment for 450 patients exactly. which you completed in yes. uh, december so what was the reason for you know selecting one particular stent onyx yeah but there is yeah first first uh, at that at that moment when we designed ebc main uh, that stent was the only one with large diameters which are drug eluting platforms and we really needed to have 4 5 and 5.0 based on estimated left main size in order to use appropriately sized stent which will not have problem with maximum expansion capacity so in case that you use imaging which was strongly recommended but of course difficult to make it mandatory but we strongly recommended Uh, image use in left main PCI for EBC main, we believe that if you have a large size diameter in the left main, you can really use 4.5 or 5.0. Even in case that LAD is not such huge, uh, we recommend to deploy at low pressure and then post the LAD proximally and preserve architecture of the stent. And Resolute Onyx, at my best knowledge, is the only C marked stent which can be uh, uh, deployed up to 6 mm inside the left main which is really maximum that we may need in regular practice excellent so i invite the comments from our chairpersons dr pk dev dr dotto ravin any comments please what is your experience you are all very experienced cardiologists dr pravin is there Pravin Chandru, Dr. Shomir Dani, 
Dr. Hire Mota, I can see you. You are a great operator. You have done many left main PCI and you have a lecture too. Dr. Chirish, any comments, please? Hi, everybody. Uh, Goran, another superb uh, talk. Uh, I think uh, the clarity is so good that we understand every step that is taken, why we are doing it. I mean, we may be doing correct steps, but it's good to understand from your talk that, yes, we are doing the correct step for a correct reason. Thank you very uh, much. I think the um, uh, proximal stent expansion, uh, which creates a sort of hinge uh, and then a narrow distal stent, not narrow, but slightly less diameter distal stent, uh, that creates a good access to the side and that is the main principle of doing a pump. Exactly. Now, at what level do you put the balloon marker when you do a pot? That's yeah. important because uh, yes. if you are too proximal, it will not uh, be adequate. And if you are too sure. distal, you may be hurting the side branch. Yeah, thank you very much, Shirish. This is really very important for uh, routine practice. You need to know the characteristics in the uh, flow chart of your uh, balloon that you have in your cut lab. So we cannot give general recommendation. You need to know the distance between distal marker of your balloon and the maximum diameter of inflated balloon because uh, these two don't all, always overlap. Sometimes it's uh, more proximal, sometimes it's exactly at the level of the distal marker. So by knowing that idea is to position distal marker in front of carina as much as needed to have full expansion at the level of carina. You need to reach maximum diameter at the level of the side branch ostium in order to push some of the struts and open access towards the side branch. So you should not cross. Most of the time, you need to check in the position in which angiographically bifurcation angle is the widest. So you need to make uh, sure that bifurcation is fully open to avoid foreshortening. Sometimes some geography is misleading. So it's better if you do a couple of projections in advance and see in which projection you will actually position balloon for pot, for distal part. For proximal part, I think it's extremely important and especially for repot to open proximal edge of the stand. And for repot compared to pot, we actually don't try to go distal any longer. We learn from the October study from OCT evaluation that our perception that we are doing correct report actually result in majority of cases in side branch compromise because and geographically looks correct. But if you do OCT, actually you are too deep. And that's why I selected this image yeah. with the uh, uh, deep position and shift of the metal towards the side branch. Uh, you can use uh, uh, angiographic stent enhancement software if you don't do imaging. So with stent boost or stent whiz, uh, you can also approximate position of the proximal balloon marker in order not to be completely outside of the proximal stent edge. But if you don't use images, I think uh, nowadays stent enhancement software can be a good surrogate. Thank you very much, Goran, for your excellent comments. Now, let, let me come to the chat box because our president, Dr. Minal Kanti Dash, has uh, told that uh, it's a very beautiful meeting and he has appreciated both the lectures of yours and also Ferenc. You know him, you came to Thank Kolkata you. and of to course. India several times. So he is our uh, present president. Thank you, Minal, for your excellent comments. It's in the chat box. Thank you. And Dr. Devobroto Rai, who is a very young dynamic cardiologist interventionist, he has given a comment, will, will a combination of thin strut and nano crush going to improve outcome in left main branch PCI, left main bifurcation but, PCI? Yeah, we, we need data. I mean, hypothetically, thin struts should be uh, favorable characteristics. Nano crush. I, I have to be honest, I'm not sure what it exactly means in regular practice, because trying to be nano crush, you may miss the ostium. I think that uh, procedure that was well validated and suggested by Professor Shaoli Yang Chen already documented that minimal protrusion of uh, probably two millimeters inside the main vessel stand has enough randomized evidence 
for superiority compared in complex scenario compared to provisional or different other two stand techniques. Nano crash, I think we need to wait and see the evidence and then accept or re reject. Thank and you very much. Uh, uh, Demand, can I ask Goran a question? Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 the, sure. The position of the balloon <laughs> when you do a final part or a report, uh, yes. is it different if you're done a DK crash or a mini crash and if you're done a tap? Uh, because yeah. in tap, the yeah. stent is protruding back into the main muscle. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're a little exactly. bit too deep, you might be hurting the protruding portion of the sure. tap. Sure. Uh, when we speak about proximal repot, actually, we have to distinguish when we talk, we have to distinguish two different procedures repot from proximal edge uh, inflation. In tap, we usually don't recommend routine final pot. We actually say just go very proximal and just make sure that proximal edge is open. In DK crash, I think it's very important, or any variation of crash, there is no protruding metallic neocarina. So I think what could be properly performed in different manner as in tap in which you have metallic neocarina and by inflating balloon, it's very difficult to, to control because after axial opening, when you reach maximum axial diameter, your balloon continues to open in the longitudinal direction. And by increasing pressure, you are actually pushing uh, with the tip of the balloon metallic neocarina and you compromise the side branch. So I fully agree with your comment. We have to distinguish way of final balloon inflation in tap compared to any other technique because in all other techniques, I think you can do a final pot but for tap, I think proximal edge inflation is enough. Uh, there is a comment from our great friend, Dr. Ramesh Dagavati, who, uh, who is a great operator, and I have got let, uh, great respect for him, that he is uh, telling, he has a very good suggestion, that he told that I hope that newer generation stents will show benefit over CABG. And we hope that Dr. Ferenc and Goran will have another EBC study to prove this algorithm you know thank you uh, Ravish, for your comments thank, <laughs> thank you. you but i don't yeah. think that any company will invest money anymore <laughs> in comparison. <laughs> yeah. yeah dr anjanlal dotto you are there you, you have not been comment yeah yeah, yeah, yeah sure yeah yeah uh, what, what is i think very important um garan uh, thank you for your excellent presentation so you you could demonstrate uh, the importance of, of um, many, many uh, steps uh, in, for complex PCI and bifurcation lesions. What younger doctors should know and uh, should um, have in the cath lab is, is this um, spectrum of very short balloons. So you, you should have uh, 10 millimeters, eight millimeters short, balloons um, to, to perform in perfect um, part. I think this is important. Not yeah, to, that's very important. Not yeah. Deep and, and yeah. Deep. yeah, yeah, Anjunda, yeah. I have been looking for you for long, please. Yeah, I, I, I have a comment to make that is in relation to Dr. Jura's Guran's lecture. It was a fantastic lecture. Yeah, the best sure. of biophysics stenting was there. And what we saw in the cath lab screen, and in reality, what is there in, in the real viable heart? Absolutely. That was fantastic that the journey is in reality how it is looks. So From it was inside. very much inspiring. And one particular comment I like most for me, at least, as you said, that in provisional stenting, you need not always dilate the side branch. Yeah. In provisional stenting, you need not always do the side runs creasing as well. Those are basic things, but we often try to go for it, feeling temptation to do it, and then end up with the dissections. So that exactly. particular basics should be kept in mind always, and we should not be tempted to open it further. And Thank just I much. want to, yeah, I just want to tell a comment from Dr. Antonio Colombo that he has shown that if the lesions are 50 to 75% in a side branch, in about 70% of the, or 75% of the patient, the physiology becomes negative. That means is more than 0.8.
and only in 25% of the patients where it looks to be more than 75%, it is physiologically positive. And that is what Dr. Goran also told. And I really appreciate again, Goran, your uh, comments that IVAS is not required in all the patients. So very, very valuable comments from both of you. Miroslav, thank you very much for your great comments. I, I was you. seeing your comments that the pot balloon length is very important and only eight millimeter or 10 millimeter balloon. Otherwise we'll go over, go, uh, we'll go above the proximal age of the main branch 10. And that is very dangerous in sometimes causing dissection. So in our labs, we should have small balloons and uh, NC balloons, non-compliant balloons, so that we can go higher. And it's very important so that the proximal age of the stent opposes with the surface. And uh, there are a few more comments. So there are a lot of Doctor. praise for both of you. And I take this opportunity to invite both of you and to be, book your days because both of our very busy, busy cardiologists, 31st of October and 1st of November, timing is little ahead, 6.30 to 9.30, because we decided that, and you were also supposed to come in April, but you know, it was abundant. So uh, somebody should mute, I think, some noise coming from behind. So I invite both of you and all of you present over here, all our panelists, including Ramesh and Fajila, to become our, you know, speaker and also, uh, you know, expert commentator and chair for that. So the, it will start 6.30, both the days, Saturday and Sunday. And uh, it is 31st of October and 1st of November. So Goran and Miroslav, if you kindly agree and if you kindly book the dates, we'll be very obliged. Indian cardiologists want to listen from the horse's mouth, the best of comments on bifurcation. Ramesh, is, uh, do you want to tell anything? Because Fajila yes. has not been telling. Fajila, have you got any comments? Fajila? I'm just, you know, overwhelmed. Okay. Every time I listen okay. to them, I learn such a lot. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Very true. <laughs> and Please you'll be prepared enjoy. for the next really one or lot. two minutes. Yeah, we, you are going to have your lecture. So Ramesh, yes. comments, please. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a gone very good points. I think now we can have to rename DK crush as a, a double cross, a crush and double case. So it should be DC DK technique uh, rather than <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but Dr. V T Shah is asking you a question, Dr. Goran from uh, yes. uh, Mumbai, uh, about uh, the distal cross in uh, provisional is uh, accepted, uh, but in the two stent technique. Uh, in the recent EBC paper, we mentioned about uh, non-distal cell cross, uh, recross in two stent. And why is that? No, I don't know which uh, article you are referring to, because except for crush, in which proximal or central cross is recommended, in absolutely every other bifurcation technique with two stents or with provisional, distal cross is suggested. And the reason for that is to cross distal in order to push metal and scaffold the ostium of the side branch. Only in, in crush, because of the gap which you artificially create when you are crushing protruded stent from the side branch, you try to avoid the most distal crossing because you may extend that gap. So except for crush, absolutely in every bifurcation technique, distal cross is suggested. And therefore, Absolutely. it is called a carina strut, isn't it, Goran? Because yes, it does, yes. it helps in yes, keeping exactly. the carina intact. Yes. Yeah. So but it's known know, as be, carina strut. Yeah. Yes. Looks like Dr. Khanna has honest. a question. Yeah, to Dr. Khanna, please. Honest. Brief comments, Dr. Khanna. Yeah, Goran, I had a question. You know, when the sure. distal crush is so, I mean, distal wiring is so important, or distal crossing. Why yeah. uh, do you say imaging is not very important? I mean, with an OC. No, I never guided. said that. Sorry. I never said it's not very important. I just said you don't need to use imaging in absolutely every bifurcation. So it's not absolutely everything should be adjusted according to complexity. So if you have simple bifurcation, 110, I don't see the purpose of routine use of imaging. If you see short bifurcation with no significant disease, no calcium, at the ostium of the side branch. I don't know what you will gain by using imaging. Imaging does not work on intention to treat. By putting IVUS catheter, you need to gain information and you need to react. You react in case that you have 
unclear anatomy, unclear diameters, presence of calcium, distribution of plaque, amount of calcium, uh, superficial, deep. So these are the additional information which you gain by using imaging. And I don't say it's not important. It's very important, but should be properly used and should be used in as many cases as your financing system, your experience and knowledge can uh, allow you in your cath lab. Uh, we still, in uh, Excel study, uh, with mandatory imaging, strongly suggested, we again have only 70% of cases done with imaging. In a randomized study, fully controlled, when I was, was strongly recommended, again, two thirds of the cases were finished with IVUS and one, one third without imaging. So I think it's even worse if you say uh, you have to always use imaging. I, I don't think it's appropriate yeah. mm -hmm. and I don't think it's appropriate, but I yeah. don't say imaging is not important. Imaging is extremely mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. when indicated. Yeah, this is we got it. Question. Thank you very I, much, Dr. Goran. Talking yeah. about the, to be sure that you have crossed the distal strut. Uh, that uh, can only be sure while we are imaging it, unless uh, you have a stent which you yes. can have a very good uh, stent boost and you are sure. Otherwise, exactly. the way to actually be sure would be by imaging. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, only would, that three-dimensional no, OCT. Whole, yeah. yeah, but the in, job my whole life, yeah. in my whole yeah. life, yeah. When, I when I were able to cross with the wire into the side branch, yeah. after 15 minutes of efforts to cross, I never pulled back because it's not distal strut. So distal strut is recommended, but in case you are not in the distal strut, yeah. of course you continue in the strut in which you cross. And I will not use 1000 euro OCT catheter to make sure that I'm crossing distal strut because there is no clear benefit in using distal strut as a marker of successful intervention. I appreciate. I have, Dr. Ferenc, you, you have some comments yeah. to me? Um, I fully agree with Goran. Uh, so we, we, if we have really problems with the wiring, so I let one wire, floppy wire in the position, take other one, go really with knuckle technical, try to go very close to the carina. You can uh, really um, choose a bigger zoom in X-ray machine and a stand both or clear stand as, as uh, uh, I think we both uh, has suggested to use it. Please, the more than new machines, X-ray machines have this option, have this um, function and uh, I, I'm use it more and more. And uh, this is very, very helpful. Thank you very much for your valued comments. And I th thank both the speakers and especially Goran because he had a TCT Thank connect, you, uh, you know, seven, yeah, I'm yeah, 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 I know eight, TCT I'm connect sorry, should, I'm so <laughs> abandoning it, he has given importance, and thank, thank you, you very much, and I would appreciate if you continue, provided you don't disturb that should, okay, thank, thank you, you very much, much Gorana, and thank you, you, Dr. Ferenc, you be with us, because we'll be continuing, and I, uh, you know, invite Dr. Fajila Malik from Bangladesh, who have a large experience of doing uh, you know, this left main PCI in the patients of this subcontinent, and he's a great, she's a great operator, and I have got great regards for her. So, Fajila, you please give your delivery, your lecture, does CABG excel over PCI in dealing with left main bifurcation? Fajila, please. Yes, thank you. Can I have the slide share slide, please? Can I have that so that I can click on that? I can't seem to have that. The green icon where you click. Yeah, on we can there. see. Uh, you are not getting that one. It is on the no. extremely right hand side. It's in uh -huh. green color. Yeah, Share I screen. Yeah, right. it is, but I can't see it. It's not. Oh. Uh, but I can see it in my laptop. Share screen. Yeah, ma'am, on the bottom. Some of your screen, you would see some tabs, and there is a green color share screen yeah. button. You just no, need. Yeah. There isn't. Not here. Oh. Not so not you here. please, you please review it. And by the time I invite some comments from our uh, fellow commentators, from our uh, great faculty, Dr. Keshav Murthy, you are a great operator. You, are, uh, you have tremendous experience in imaging. I see you are not passing any comments. Keshav, please. So, Fajila, you Thank please you, get ready for the lecture. Yeah. I just Fajila, you might have to log out and log back in, Fajila. So, Ma'am, if you could just move the uh, mouse, uh, that will appear up. Sir, uh, you're able to hear me? 
Yeah, we can hear you. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a basic doubt. When you do a pot, should the side branch wire to be removed or not? Yeah. My, traditionally my idea was to remove place. it, but today Dr. Koran was, uh, the picture was showing that the side branch wire was there when you do a pot. Right. Uh, for the DK crush, actually, it is recommended to crush it without the wire in place after making sure there's no dissection. And then you do a pot. So as a, that's a double, so the second crush that we are doing. So without the wire in place. But uh, after that, uh, stenting the main vessel, then when we are doing a pot, the wire could be in place because we have already recrossed the, uh, the uh, uh, side branch again. Yeah, great comments, Ramesh. Thank you. So, Dr. Fajila, please, we are ready to Thank listen you. to you. Yeah, sorry for the glitch. No, no, it's all right, to... Fajila. It happens. It does happen. Yeah. Please, right. go on. So, chairpersons, friends and colleagues, it's indeed a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here today. I work at the National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute, Dhaka, Bangladesh. We started with a single cat lab in 1999, and at present, we have five fully functioning cath labs until August of this year, we've done more than 45,000 PCIs. We started doing left main PCI on a regular basis since 2007. And by August of 2020, we've done more than 2,200 left main PCIs. And over the years, we've learned a few lessons, lessons that have taught us uh, to get good long-term results because let's face it, PCI, left main PCI is a great revascularization strategy for many patients. And one lesson is to keep the procedure as simple as possible. So like in this uh, complex distal left main trifurcating lesion where the LED was a CTO, after opening up the LED, we did pre-dilatation. And after that, we took a single strength from the left main to the LED we deployed it, did proximal optimization, and the immediate result was good, and so was the three years result. So keeping procedures simple is a good strategy for great long-term results. And sometimes left wing PCI is the only option available for a very, very sick patient. And that was the case for this gentleman who came to us with extensive anterior myocardial infarction he was in cardiogenic shock. So we wired his vessel. And after wiring, we did thrombus aspiration. After thrombus aspiration, we went on to start the patient on GP2B3 receptor blockers. We gave him intracoronary adrenaline, intracoronary adenosine. And then we proceeded to do direct stenting with a 3.5 by 30 deaths from the left main to the LAT. We did proximal optimization and we realized that there was quite a bit of flag shifting into the LCS. So we did a tap technique now. We used a 2.75 stent for the LCX. We did final kissing, we did report, and uh, this was the final result. And I'm happy to say that this patient made it and we were able to discharge this patient a few days after this procedure. And indeed, what this case highlights is that patients who come to us with ST segment elevation MI and have a huge thrombus burden, have unprotected left main and present as cardiogenic shock, these are a very high risk subgroup of patients. However, PCI is a feasible treatment option associated with reasonably good outcomes for this kind of very sick patient. A recent study showed that when PCI was done, the hospital mortality for cardiogenic shock was around 32%. However, the long-term prognosis is excellent in hospital survivors with an 89.5% survival rate at one year. Another rule for these long-term results is to use a properly sized stem, and that has emphasized by the previous uh, speakers. And just to highlight this, there was this 68 year old gentleman who had CABG done seven years ago. Five months back, he started having chest pain for which he underwent a check angiogram in another center. 
And there they found that his SVG to OM and PGA grafts were occluded. His Lima to LAD graft they found fatal. And they also found severe stenosis in distal left main, which extended to the proximal part of the LCA. So in that center, what they did, they did a PCI from left main to LCX with a drug eluding stent of 2.75 by 30 millimeters. And I'm sure most of you will agree that a 2.75 millimeter stent in the left main sounds a bit undersized. And that's what happened. A few months down the road, he had again severe chest pain. He was hospitalized this time in our center and we did his check angiogram. And we found that there was severe 95 to 99% ISR involving the origin of the LCX. The LED was occluded. The RCA was a dominant vessel and this was also severely diseased. His SVG to OM graft was occluded. The Lima to LAD graft was patent, as had been disclosed earlier. However, the LAD, the native LAD distant to the anastomotic site was severely diseased. So we obviously wanted to have a look at the stent, but we were unable to pass our IVAS as was expected. So what we did is we did pre-dilatation with first a 2.5 by 12 and then by a three uh, millimeter NC balloon. After our pre-dilatation, we were able to pass the IVAS catheter and sure enough, the stem that we saw was grossly undersized. So we did aggressive further post-dilatation using a 3.5 by eight millimeter NC balloon and we went up to very high pressure. We went up to 24 millimeters atmosphere. After this, we thought that we would be able to deploy a stent, this time obviously a larger one, a 3.5 by 38, but we could not pass our stent through the previously undersized stent. So we took a Godzilla and with the help of the Godzilla, we were able to pass our stent. Once our stent was in position, we deployed our stent, did post dilatation, did proximal optimization, and we did a final IVA study that showed that the stent now, the second stent, seemed to be well opposed and adequately sized. We then went on to try to fix the native LED because even though the Lima was patent, it was not really helping the patient much. And we were eventually able to wire the uh, native LED with the wire passing through the tortuous Lima with the help of a Corsair, that is a tapered tip microcatheter. We did pre-dilatation of the native LED with a two by 15 millimeter balloon. And then we took the most deliverable stent that we had on our shelf, a 2.5 by 22, a drug eluding stent. It went easily through the tortuous lima, and then we were able to position it in the native LED. We deployed it, did post dilatation with a 2.75 by 12 NC balloon, and this was the final risk. And this case was done in 2018, April, and uh, I'm very happy to say that this patient is doing well and he is on medication. And obviously this case goes to highlight that one of the main reasons of ISR in left main would be uh, undersized stent. And this undersized stent is also the reason for acute and late throm stent thrombosis. And to get good long-term results, one has to have experience and expertise. You need to use proper tools. Imaging definitely pay, does play a role as has been discussed and you need to use optimal pharmacotherapy in patients who require it. But this second patient, he also uh, was a post CABG case. His CABG was done in Kuwait because he worked there uh, in 2018. A few months down the road, he developed chest pain and in Kuwait, they did a PCI for him, 
with the lima to LED, they put a stent from left main to LED and a separate stent in the from L6 to OM, and they didn't put any stent in the ostium. So they used two stents for this patient. He came back to Bangladesh, he was having severe chest pain, and so we did his angiogram. And so this gentleman has already had a CABG, and this is how it looks. He's already had a CABG, then he has had a PCI, and now he is having chest pain. So the, you can appreciate that there is severe ISR in the shaft of the left main, and also there is 99% stenosis at the origin of the LCX. Uh, we did a pre-OCT run, which confirmed our suspicions that the disease was very severe. After this, uh, we did a DK crush for this uh, gentleman because upfront we knew that we, he would need a double strength strategy and this was the best option for him. And after DK crush, we did a post-procedure OCT as well as a post-procedure IVUS and the results were fine. And this case was actually done as a live case to Kolkata last year. I think it was around September. Uh, 29th or something, and this patient is also under follow-up and he's doing well. This was his final result. So post-CBG patients are a real problem for us. And when they come with left main disease, you need to do PCI for them. And what about very frail patients? So no, nobody talks about very frail patients and they're not, never in studies as well, but frail elderly patients are a reality. And there was, this is the story of an 82 year old, very old frail female. And you could look at her and you could really be scared because she was really small and she was frail. She had multiple comorbidities, diabetes, PKD, and she had COPD. She had severe angina and was admitted in another hospital. They couldn't manage her with maximal anti-anginal therapy. So they did her angiogram and the angiogram showed severe triple vessel disease, including the left main. The surgeons in that hospital were not at all keen to do surgery on her considering her age, her multiple comorbidities and her frailty. So she was sent to our center for PCI. And frailty has such a wide spectrum. And frail patients are indeed a very high risk patient where surgery often is not an option. And the cause of frailty is also the pathophysiology is multifactorial. And it's very, very difficult to treat or to understand as well. So here was our frail patient. This is how her angiogram was. So we decided that as she was so frail, she had CKD, we would stage the procedure. And what we did is on the first day, we just did the RCT. She tolerated the procedure well. And after five days, we decided to tackle the left side. And as you can appreciate, the left side, the calcification could be visualized even on fluoroscopy. So from the very beginning, we knew that with this kind of calcium, she would need rotablation. And we would have to be very gentle with her so she would not tolerate a very prolonged procedure. So we did rotablation first from the LCX, left main to LCX. And then we did rotablation from left main to LAT. After rotablation for this lady also, we did DK crush because Upfront, we had decided that she would require double stent strategy. She tolerated the procedure well, and this was the final result of the DK crush. And she, this case was done in 2019, January, and she's an 83-year-old, and she's now leading a fairly active life, one and a half years, nearly one year, nine months down the road. So PCI does really impact a lot of patients in a positive manner, patients who would have been refused surgery otherwise. And this is the real life scenario. And obviously in this kind of case, you need to strategize. 
So one thing we also have learned is that never do a complex left wing PCI on an ad hoc basis. Strategize, talk to the surgeons, talk to the patients, and only then to the case to the best of your ability. And proper lesion preparation is absolutely mandatory. And uh, rotablation should be used early on in case of heavily calcified vessels. And for elderly patients with multiple comorbidities, we have found that staging is a very helpful thing to do. So with all that in mind, let's come to the Excel trial, right? And Excel trial looked fine because initially in the 30 days, the uh, PCI was definitely better than CABG. And uh, if you look at the symptoms and the quality of life, three years down the road, PCI and CABG quality of life in China frequency, everything was spot on. And the conclusion was that PCI may be considered as an acceptable or even preferred revascularization modality for selected patients with left main coronary disease, a decision which should be made after hard team discussion, taking into account each patient's individual circumstances and preferences. So all of this sounds very nice. But what happened? Five years down the road, we saw that the curves, the PCI arm, and the CABG arm diverged. And we saw that there was an increased uh, maze in case of PCI than in case of CABG at five years. And this sort of started the alarm bells ringing. But let's look at the primary endpoints at five years a bit more carefully. Now, if we look at death, we find that the overall maze was 22% in the PCI arm and it was 19.2% in the CABG arm at five years. If we look at death, all cause death, it was 13% in the PCI arm and it was 9.9% .9 in the CABG arm. And this was a cause of concern. But let's look a bit more deep. If it is definite cardiovascular death, then it is 5% in the PCI arm and it is 4.5% in the CABG arm which translates to only 0.5% difference. That's not really very significant. The main death was in the non-cardiovascular death. And if you look at myocardial infarction, very procedural myocardial infarction was 6% in the CBG arm and 3.9% in the PCI arm. Repeat revascularization definitely was higher in the PCI arm but it was a lot less in the CABG arm. So what were the controversies or the cause of concerns of the five-year outcome of exit? One concern was that is mortality really greater after PCI compared with CABG? And the other was about the definition, the definition of myocardial infarction, why was the universal definition not used? If we go a bit deeper, the observational difference in mort mortality was actually modest. It was around, uh, the delta was 3% over five years, which is 0.6% per year. So 87% versus 90% survival. So you can take your pick between these two. And the mortality was an underpowered exploratory endpoint, not specified for hypothesis testing. And it was one of the 35 non-powered secondary endpoints. And there was nearly identical cardiovascular death. We've already shown that. The difference in the death was mainly in non-cardiovascular deaths, which was prim primarily infections and cancer. So the, we might ask ourselves, is the observed mortality difference in Excel real? And also to improve precision for such low frequency outcomes, we must look at larger high quantity randomized control trials. So if we look at the four large randomized control trials that have been taken in these last few years, these last 10 years, we have the syntax, the five-year outcome of the syntax, we now have actually the 10-year outcome, the pre-combat <coughs> five-year outcome, we have the 10-year actually now, the Excel five-year outcome and the global five-year. As we look closely at the mortality, 
we find that there's actually not really much significant difference in any of the trials. And here we are studying more than 4,000 patients who underwent CABG or PCM. And I think the most important slide is this one, the Syntex 10-year result. Syntex was done with the first generation stent, and we have already discussed the previous uh, questions, answers, sessions have proved that now we've got such a lot of better stents. But even with the first generation stent, 10 years down the road, the mortality was identical, 26% in either arm. And this is, I think, a very significant thing that we need to consider. There was a controversy about why I was in the third universal definition of MI. Why wasn't that adhered to in the Excel trial? Well, what they did is they used a definition which would encompass both PCI and CABG. They used the same cutoff points for both PCI and CABG. And this definition was evidence-based. It was not arbitrary. And the definition was developed and agreed by a large group of surgeons and interventional cardiologists, and the number of surgeons and interventional cardiologists was equal in number. They had a detailed literature review, and only after that was the definition decided on. So I think uh, this is not really a major issue about why the sky universal definition was not followed. And if we come back to today, what do we know? What is different from Excel now, five years down the road since Excel was published? we have all agreed that we have better stent design now. That goes without saying. We have more potent pharmacotherapy that we are using more often. Ticagrelor and Prasugrel are widely available and used. Operators have gained experience over the time. We have better ideal physiology and anatomy. And definitely with the previous lectures, just go to prove that we have a better understanding of what bifurcation lesions mean and how to better take up, tackle them. We know that now because Koran and others have worked so hard to teach us how to understand bifurcations better. And I think all of this together translates to the fact that we can do a better job now. If we come back to our 2,200 patients, actually 79% of these patients were distal left main disease. Of these distal left main patients, only in 26% did we use a double stent technique. For the vast majority, single stent still works and it gives you great results. In the double stent technique, the number one uh, technique that we used was a tap technique. But we've started using the DK crush very frequently over the last couple of years. And the generation of stent was a second or a third generation stent in 94% of our patients. And obviously, when you use the latest thinner stud stents, which can be fully expanded to the size of your vessel, it does make a difference in the outcome. And we use in 52.7% of our patients a zoculimus eluting stent. In a third of our patients, it was an eporolimus eluting stent. As I was mentioning, we've managed to follow up the vast majority of our patients. And uh, over these years, it's been quite a long time. Our median follow-up is more than 37 months. And uh, we've done symptom-driven check angiogram for 216 patients where we found 24 had developed ISR. And over the follow-up of 2,213 patients, our overall MACE is 9.3%. And just another brief comment, uh, we had a large population of patients who were zotrolimus eluting, where we use zotrolimus eluting stents. And diabetes is very, very prevalent in Bangladesh. So we decided to divide the patients who had zotrolimus eluting stent in left main disease and in a diabetic group and in a non-diabetic group. And uh, this uh, data analysis was done by an independent organization. And we were very happy when they came up with the results that the one year and six year mortality rate was identical in left main PCI diabetic as well as non-diabetic patients who had been 
implanted with the Zotulima Sevitin stem. And this was a very exciting news for us. So coming back to left main uh, PCI versus CABG and the Excel controversy. Well, PCI obviously has very good early advantages. CABG has very good late advantages. The number one advantage being that there is less chance that your patient would need repeat revascularization. But there is actually no significant major difference in long-term survival, maze, or quality of life. And I would like to conclude by uh, you know, quoting you, uh, Dr. Eugene Brown, when he wrote the editorial for when the first Excel was published, he wrote, the take home message from the Excel trial is that the majority of patients with unprotected left main artery disease, which was a very serious, life threatening and shortening and disabling condition early in my professional lifetime can now be managed equally well by means of two strategies of revascularization if carried out by expert, experienced teams such as those participating in the Excel. And from the entire team of National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute, I would like to say thank you for giving me this opportunity of presenting our experience in this gallery. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Vajila, for your excellent lecture, superb lecture. You have shown excellent cases and you have shown cases of cardiogenic shock taken as primary PCI with excellent recovery because we know the mortality is very high in those patients and you have shown you have done it very nicely. And not only if they improve, 89% survive three five, to five years, their NYJ class improves to class one or maximum class two. Regarding the second case, it was also a beautiful one where you have shown that you have put a stent through the lima. And uh, just one thing to mention uh, that's a little important, that we should engage the you know, lima catheter in the, at the origin of the lima. And the engagement, we should always see that there is no spasm. That's very important because many a times there is strong spasm and many a things happen. So it's very important. And while dealing and while passing a wear, we should always give some nitro and we should be little cautious that lima, you know, is not disturbed. And you have shown beautiful cases of rotablation. Your literature was ex review was excellent, superb, superb. You have also shown that mm -hmm. the mortality is, why the mortality was high uh, in the, you know, uh, in Excel trial at five years. And I would invite Dr. Ferenc's comments that why the mortality was little high in the Excel trial at five years, but it was not in the syntax trial at 10 years, PCI versus CABG. What is your uh, take home message on that? Miroslav, can you listen? Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You, are, you are audible, sir. Yeah, you are yeah. audible. Uh, fine. So as you, as you saw the data after 10 years, from the syntax trial by patients uh, with the left main PCI and cabbage, there was practically identical survival um, uh, for both um, treatment groups. And um, this was 26% after 10 years. If you now um, take into account um, excellent study, um, there was um, a very, pre-selection of very good US centers and uh, some European centers. Uh, and it was clear um, to, to be very ambitious uh, with, uh, with the treatment. You, you heard from Goran, um, despite the recommendation, uh, we should, um, it should be used, uh, I was in this uh, study, uh, it was used in 70%, but compared this to, to the uh, earlier study syntax, there was much less. And compare this to the daily routine. Uh, I would suggest in the daily routine, we are with the IWAS uh, below 10%. And uh, for that reasons, I think um, there is a difference uh, between, between uh, both studies. 
one more uh, comment to the um, Nobel study, as you as you don't mention Nobel study, which is also randomized huge study, and there was um, benefit practically benefit for for um, surgery, and I asked it. I was thinking uh, how it's possible, and they had in many cases. Um, just uh, doing uh, thoracica mammaria to LAD diagonal by uh, and maybe one one connection to the circ branch and that's it and uh, that's why uh, they have such excellent uh, results in, in the novel uh, trial in the excellent uh, trial I think the results are still are still okay at least for me thank you Dr. Dotto, you have uh, some uh, suggestions, I think. Yeah. Firstly, it's an excellent deliberation, Fajal. Nice to see you after a long time. And uh, your comments, your review literature was fantastic. I just want to make out uh, one or two points. Like, for example, you can look at the Excel study result in three phases, time phases. Zero to 30 days, the PCI events are lower. The main reasons is probably related to stroke incidence a little higher in the CABG group. 30 days onwards up to three years, it is non-inferior to CABG. And beyond five years, as you rightly pointed out, CABG appears to be have a fewer events compared to PCI. And that is more or less driven mostly by revascularization, need to revascularization to a large extent. Although we have a pre-procedural MI higher but that is actually a non-ischemic enzyme rise, and that is higher in both the sites. We cannot explain the difference on the basis of universal definition of MI, particularly in the Excel study. It is applicable in uh, Nobel study. And another important issue is that in Excel study, the syntax score below 32. All the patients had syntax score below 32. Unlike Nobel, the Nobel had a syntax score above 33 or above in about 8%. So Nobel was relatively a little uh, what's the poorer patients compared to Excel studies. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we should also take into consideration, as you rightly pointed out, the technical advance, the experience, the antiplated drugs, all these are much more important today than what it was in Nobel or Excel time. So if we choose the right patient for left main bifurcation lesions, taking into consideration the clinical pictures, the scenario, the evidences that we have, we have a large number of patients still likely to benefit from PCI if it is taken in the proper center, as Bronald rightly pointed out, in the experienced good hand, and we have. And we should also leave certain patients for CABG, no denying the fact. And you have rightly pointed out the balance between the two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. for your kind comments. And uh, Dr. Mohanan is there. Or Professor Rakesh Jadav. Professor Rakesh Jadav there. He is a professor and a very dynamic cardiologist from our All India Institute of Medical Science. Any comments? Rakesh, are you there? Dr. Mohanan, Dr. P.K. Dev, Dr. Shomit Dani. Okay, so I think this was a very good uh, you know, discussion and thank you. Dr. Ferenek also before, because your uh, comments were very nice and very practical. And Dr. Fajila Malik, as usual, you have spoken greatly. And I would like to last uh, invite Dr. Ramesh Dagubati to have his brief comments. Ramesh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kali, and a fantastic talk by Dr. Fajila. It is really great uh, to see you and present in such an eloquent uh, uh, manner. Uh, I think, uh, the, in my opinion, I think uh, left main is still a little bit of a concern because we do not have strong data to support that PCI is non-inferior to bypass surgery. And as uh, Dr. Dato uh, 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 pointed out, even though we think that uh, the site reported syntax score was only less than 32, but uh, when actually core lab an analyzed, uh, there are several patients about... Uh, nearly uh, 500 patients or so uh, totally with the uh, syntax code more than 33 who did better with the bypass surgery. 
So I think there is some flaws still that the core lab should have analyzed before randomization and should have not uh, included these group of patients. And the syntax uh, uh, extended study did show a benefit of uh, uh, PCI in, I mean, or a non-inferiority of uh, left main PCI versus cabbage. But in people who have three vessel disease concomitant with the uh, left main, they did uh, much better with the uh, uh, mortality of 21% uh, with the uh, bypass versus 26% with the PCI. So I still think, unfortunately, nobody is going to do another study. I think we have uh, addressed that, uh, but a really great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, I, Dr. I Dr. I had some, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Dr. If I, if I make a short comment, I personally see um, a huge, um, huge potential for PCI um, in patients with um, distal left main stenosis. So, for sure, our patients with distal left main stenosis will go to be will be older and older. So. Even in Europe, our patients are now 75, 80, and in average, and you will have the similar situation in a few years uh, also in, in Asia, definitely, uh, I'm sure. And what we observe is, of course, the increasing incidence of severe calcifications in the distal left main. And uh, Fasila, you showed a fantastic case with reflablation as a lesion preparation. I think this is still a point where many interventional cardiologists, even we as, as uh, uh, very good experts, I believe, uh, sometimes we are also uh, too skeptic and to, to I, um, this, and, and instead to go with rota and maybe make a channel and maybe go with a uh, uh, shockwave balloon. We say, okay, we take the non-compliant balloon, bigger, higher pressure. We okay, accept right, maybe some the result, you know, and the, the, there is a lot of uh, room um, to increase our quality. And I think to introduce more and more uh, rotablation with bigger bursts and uh, in combination maybe with um, uh, IPL, uh, method, we will um, go forward and achieve uh, better results uh, in, in the distal left main, especially in the circ area. So I'm, I'm very optimistic in this case. Hello? Hello. Diman Kali. Um, we can uh, hear you, Dr. Data. Yeah, I think uh, we, you can you can ask for the next speaker if there is no other comments. Yeah, yeah. we should go to the next presentation now. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. ready to go. Okay. Yeah, I think Dr. Hiramat. Yes. We have pleasure in inviting you for your deliberations. Please start. Dr. Hiramat is already introduced. Yeah, uh, good evening, everybody. I was going to say good afternoon, but by the time uh, it dragged on the last two hours, it's good evening to most of us, including people in Europe. So uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, one uh, stain or two stains, uh, I'm going to look like a villain when I show you a few cases in, right in the beginning. So you have... Uh, almost an identical anatomy on these two cases, on, on which I have a However, you have uh, FFR on the circumflex is uh, positive here, and it's negative here. Both are dominant left circulation. So what are you going to do? And uh, we ended up with a three stand strategy on this patient who had uh, uh, FFR positive on the circumflex, the diameter of the left main matching more with the circumflex and not so much with the LED. So the main stent is actually going from left main to circumflex with two uh, uh, side branch uh, uh, stents and a result of this nature. The other case, who had a negative FFR, we managed to uh, sort of two stents, first stent left main to LED and then a tap to the ramus and no stain to the circumflex. 
contexts. So uh, uh, clearly, uh, we get a lot of cases uh, where you don't have to just think whether it's two or one, but you may be thinking of three or two or three or zero, uh, three or one. So this is the uh, case one and case two, and uh, based on the negative F of R on this, we could avoid stenting to the third uh, vessel. So this is over the last about uh, nine years that we have built up our experience. Uh, but what I'm trying to show you is in this uh, cases, uh, uh, two 93 patients, one stent is much less compared to two stent strategies. This is contrary to most of the things that you've been seeing across the globe. But I'll tell you some of the reasons and as I show you the cases, you'll probably understand. So this was a gentleman who uh, was actually pretty old, frail, and uh, extensive disease. A lot of calcification. And uh, so we have this kind of calcification with left main distal showing uh, critical disease. And you can see this circumflex is a very dominant circulation. So in these kind of dominant circulations to the left system, I never think of a single stand. To me, it's always a two stand strategy. Like in this case, you see the ostium is not deceased, at least on an angiogram. Uh, so this is the uh, epicranial. So we put a stent in the uh, proximal LED and then get ready for a bifurcation. So this was done with the decay crush. Hmm. Uh, the rotablator was done to LED first based on the IBIS. And uh, this is a stent placed in the uh, ostium, looking at the uh, aleocranial view, and then a final kiss, and then a post kiss, uh, you see a nice uh, expansion. We like to do, and we do actually a lot of uh, imaging in these kind of cases. Uh, but uh, if you see this kind of angiogram, I think uh, it's. No, this there is some noise. Somebody's talking there all the time. Can somebody put on mute? Yeah, mic please continue please, talking. Please mute the other speakers. Speakers, please mute the other other side. So uh, this was a decay crush, and uh, uh, so two stent strategy. Almost always for me, whenever the left circumflex is a dominant vessel. Uh, the next scenario where I like to uh, bifurcation uh, disease at both these. Uh, you can see LED ostium and a circumflex ostium. And uh, even if you want to think that you are a single stent expert, uh, I wouldn't know how you would want to do it. So this kind of case uh, to me is again a, a two stent strategy. So we do a cutting balloon, uh, then we put the first stent and the second stent, and we do a culotte on this and, uh, and end up with a result of this nature. So again, a narrow angle, as you can see here uh, uh, in, in the next case, uh, uh, strategy could be a two stent strategy. If you at all do a stent with a single stent, most of the time you would see the uh, the atheroma gets pushed towards the circumflex, leaving uh, important narrowing at the mouth. Uh, so you could, uh, so this is again a, a narrow angle, equal size vessels. So two important criteria for a culottes. And this is how we have done it. Now let me tell, show you some cases where side branch is not addressed and the case is done with a single stent. This was done in an outside hospital. Uh, 14 months later, the patient is with us and you can see only one stent is placed from left main to LAT. And uh, we actually reviewed the angiogram as to why the operator left a dominant circumflex uh, unaddressed with the stent. Uh, but honestly, um, you know, this uh, narrowing, when the operator finished the first stent, was uh, just a bit of a narrowing, didn't look bad at all. 
So I'm also very surprised that in these few months, the lesion progress. So wow. lesion may be at the mouth of circumflex, but it behaves like uh, uh, left main, especially since this is a, uh, a dominant circumflex circulation. So we image and IVIS shows that uh, stent in the LAD is uh, not expanded at all. And uh, so we need to do something to that stent also. So here we did uh, what we think is uh, delayed double Q log. That means this is a yellow one is the old stain. Uh, uh, we we lost connection probably to to Dr. Hiramat. Yeah, Dr. Ferenc, I think I'll just quickly check with Dr. MS to join again. Yeah. So at least a uh, few fantastic. Dr. Ferenc, would you would you just give us opinion about the multiple stents that have been employed in the distal left main? Would you like to avoid the number of stents, or do you go for it if it is required? Um, I would suggest um, for now we have, um, if you use Onyx stent, which has very good radial force, which can be uh, postulated uh, up to maximum six millimeters. Uh, so for left main, you can uh, you can use it uh, fantastically. One two uh, new new modern uh, new modern stands. Uh, one of them is Onyx. One of them is, uh, I believe, also Megatron. So then you can use it uh, on top. You can prolong um, um, stands which are. Um, like like a resolute uh, integrity or it can take synergy whatever is is he, hiramati is audible now yeah yeah can you hear me yeah, yeah. dr dr Fri, sorry we are going back to the speaker again yeah, yeah. okay i'm just uh, trying to recap uh, so this was the first stent 14 month old and there is a narrowing at the ocean of the circumflex the i was showed that the uh, stent in led is not expanded properly and you can see a clear under expansion at the ocean of the LED stand. So it means that we have to address the circumflex ocean as well as uh, redo the uh, stand towards the uh, uh, LED. So this is going to be the orange is going to be our first stand today. And then we plan to put one more stand towards LED. So this was a delayed culottes the yellow stent is 14 months old and now we are with a fresh stent. That's why I'm calling it a delayed. And uh, since we are going to put one more stent, we are calling it as a double Q launch. So uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, this uh, technique. I think we used a cutting balloon, but more importantly, an OPN balloon to get a good expansion. So this is important when you are doing uh, 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 doing uh, unexpanded stent, which is already uh, more than a year old. Uh, to get a good expansion, you probably need this, and uh, uh, this is the final result we have. So you can actually see how important is the left circumflex circulation, very, very dominant circulation. So this is another area where I would not hesitate putting a side branch uh, stent, and I would end up with two stent stent. Uh, when we started, and this is how it is uh, when we finished. Uh, so it was two stands. Now, uh, this is another case where uh, operator has put one stand from the left main to LAD. And again, this narrowing that you are seeing at the mouth was not that much. So operator felt not very critical. But over the length of few months, uh, the lesion has progressed. <clears throat> Again, a very dominant circulation, as you can see here. And uh, we had to uh, think of some strategy uh, to address the side branch. So in this case, uh, we had a 
good uh, stent on the left main LED on IVIS. Uh, uh, tap, old stent is here and new stent here now or you could have done a culotte. So in this particular case, uh, uh, we did a culotte. Uh, the LED stent was old, but uh, functioning well. So when you expand and do a final case, don't put too much pressure on the LED stent. The balloon here should be just about appropriately pressurized. Uh, and the main emphasis should be on this. If you use high pressure, this stent is now not a drug stent anymore. So you could uh, have uh, an issue. So this is how we ended up. Uh, another case, uh, this is how the operator ended the first procedure, sent from left main to LED. You might think why I'm showing you these kind of cases, but we are uh, fairly big referral centers and whatever problems happens in the periphery, they come, come to us. So the operator stopped at this uh, stage. Uh, the uh, circumflex is clearly not nice, the ostium. It's a very dominant circulation. And by the time the patient has come to us two months later, it is completely closed, the circumflex, and the entire left circumflex circulation and the OM branches are filling up through collaterals from the LAT. So it stands to reason that we should do something to this circumflex. So again, the option is a tap or a culotte. And in this particular case, to wire the side branch, we used a, a sasuke. Uh, you can see the sasuke is kept here and you're addressing, uh, wiring the circumflex. Another wire is kept in the OM branch. And of course, the LED had uh, the important branch over which the sasuke uh, kept. And then you, then you have, uh, 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 tap done, and you can see a nice result on this uh, particular case. So the narrowed side branch can be addressed with um, uh, tap or uh, or a culotte. Now, uh, so many times so we have these kind of uh, lesions. The main angina was obviously coming from the LAD. Uh, what do you think about the lesions in the left main lesion in the uh, circumflex OM? And of course, another important lesion here. So we did uh, stenting to this, and then we did a uh, uh, FFR to the OM branch and FFR to the LAD. And both were positive, which meant that we need to do something to the circumflex and something to the left main LAT. So in this case, uh, we uh, choose, uh, uh, again, both are options, uh, the tap or the culottes. So we stand the LAD first, and then we send the uh, uh, left main LAD as next, and then did a culotte towards the circumflex, which actually covered the OM lesion too. So this is how we have ended uh, uh, doing a culottes based on the FFR. So this is how even stent boost is very useful. When we finished uh, the stent towards circumflex, the, FFR, uh, the, OC, the stent boost clearly showed that the uh, second stent is not touching the vessel wall or for that matter, the first stent. And after doing a, stand, uh, a high pressure dilatation, stent boost shows the distent is uh, well expanded. So this kind of, I mean, many people would say, oh, what is so important about stent boost? But every imaging apart from the conventional angiogram also is very important when you're addressing uh, a left main. Now, sometimes uh, people do osseal stenting. Uh, I'm not very happy doing an osseal stent, but this stent was placed in the osseum uh, and uh, you can see the circumflex is critically narrowed in the aleocranial view. So this is the narrowed circumflex. So it's very easy to imagine here that the osseal LED stent is protruding back and you have a narrowing at the mouth. 
So you can wire the side bench uh, on the side if you want to do a mini crush and push the stent towards LED. Or if you can go through towards LED, wire uh, through the back end of the protruding stent and get the stent to hit this wall and thus uh, end up with a crush too. So we actually have gone through this. Uh, this is another case. And we have gone through the protruding back end, uh, used a balloon, pushed this stent all the way to the roof of the left wing, and put one more stent to get this kind of result. So you can do crush, or you can do a uh, 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 tap uh, under these kind of settings. So here is another case. Circumflex stent is three year old. And uh, now this patient has come with an angina. And uh, there are lesions in the proximal LED at two spots. So what are you going to do with this protruding stent? Uh, this uh, is actually uh, the wiring technique that we have used. Uh, go towards circumflex, then look up. So the wire is actually going to the protruding part of the uh, circumflex stent. And we want to hit this portion towards the roof of the left wing. So you can see on the set book, it's very easy to appreciate that the wire towards LED has gone through the struts of the protruding uh, uh, stent. So uh, we do a balloon on this. Uh, part of the protruding stent is uh, opposed. And then we put a stent uh, from left main to LED. And then we do a uh, kiss. So this is again a delayed uh, uh, culot uh, with a single stent. These are the steps that uh, we used. And always uh, don't forget to do uh, a report, especially uh, if you are doing any kind of crash, decay crash or... So we uh, like to use the OPN balloon at a very high pressure under these uh, kind of setting. Uh, since this old stent was three year old, we have also used a drug coated balloon uh, when we finished the procedure and we were doing a kiss. We used uh, here is a, a DEB or DCB towards the old stent. So this is the final result. This is another case where actually we want, this was the Austrian stent and uh, there was a lesion on angiogram uh, distal to the stent in the circumflex. This is LED. For some reason, we had difficulty in wiring this uh, vessel. We had difficulty in taking the uh, balloon and we just could not take the stents. We managed with taking a body wire, uh, inflating at this side, etc., etc., and we got the second stent here. But just for the curiosity's sake, we got a, a CT scan done a few months later, which clearly showed that what we feel as an osteal good position is may not be a good osteal position and the stent may be protruding back into the main. So we should be mentally prepared for these kind of uh, 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 technique. Now, what do you do when the side branch is pinched after the main stent is placed? So like in this case, uh, the mouth of the circumflex is not deceased. Overall, the circumflex is a good vessel. And we thought we'll do a single stent towards uh, LED. Uh, we uh, have this kind of angle, which is not a bad angle. And uh, we had to put two stents. Uh, uh, so we actually did... Uh, uh, this stenting towards uh, the LED, uh, did a pot and uh, rewired the uh, circumflex. The circumflex, however, was significantly pinched. And again, we uh, ended up putting a, a stent. Like you can see here, after putting this, uh, we had a critical narrowing of an important circumflex. So in this case, also uh, two options, tap or culotte, uh, so whatever you are familiar with, you can do. In this case, we did a culotte. And uh, I personally like culottes in these kind of important side branches because uh, you get a good metal. You can stretch it really well. 
and uh, uh, this is the final result. See the importance of this circumflex in this particular case. Uh, so this is the final result on the uh, uh, proof and strategy. Now, uh, this was a uh, ISR. Uh, this was actually a final result of a DK crush uh, uh, at the left main LED main stent and side brain stent towards circumflex. The patient comes after six months with effort and Jana, and you can see a very critical narrowing at the mouth of the circumflex. So circumflex mouth is deceased, so we do IVUS, and based on IVUS, uh, we notice that the stent is well expanded, so we decide to do a DEB towards circumflex. So this is a, a good expansion with a cutting balloon and then an NC balloon to the side branch, and then a drug delivery at the site of the ISR with a, a DEB. And this is the final result. You can see a pretty good looking and it is working well. It's more than three years. Patient is totally asymptomatic. Uh, when you don't do, and that's also you need to think when you say, I want to use two stands. Uh, and this is an important LED lesion, which was stented. It was quite away from the left main. But the same gentleman had a lesion in the mouth of the circumflex. Now, if you have to do this, so you have to bring the stand back into the left main. The diameter of left main and the diameter of uh, the OM or <coughs> the circumflex is not matching, which means uh, uh, there could be a mismatch or you put a longer stand and stretch the stand at the back end. However, uh, we were quite lucky that the FFR solved our problem. The FFR to both these branches was over 0 0.90. So we decided this would manage with uh, medical uh, management. So of course, this will need a good follow-up because the lesion, lesion can progress backwards. Uh, but uh, as of now, this lesion looks uh, uh, reasonable because patient's angina is completely gone and is fully functional. This is another case which was followed from a long time now. I think uh, some of the angiograms are 2014, but this was a trifurcation uh, lesion, not important, ramus, no disease, and uh, important lesion uh, at the mouth of the LAT. So the first time we did an FFR and we decided we leave it on medical treatment. As you can see here, FFR was uh, more than 0 0.80. And subsequent, we, of course, did an IVUS also at that time. And uh, subsequent follow-up has been a combination of, uh, 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 of a stress thallium uh, and a CT angio to see if the lesions are progressing. I would close uh, by showing you this last case. Uh, lesion towards LED appears important. Uh, no other lesion is uh, very significant. So you can do in many ways, uh, but the best strategy could be a provisional uh, uh, here, and then do a stent to circumflex if it is required. However, this uh, disease was uh, also quite important. So uh, we um, actually uh, did a uh, decay crush. You can see the crush portion of the stent on stent boost. So this stent was placed for first uh, towards uh, uh, circumflex and then uh, left main LED and a decay crush of this nature. So I showed you lots of cases where two stent strategies uh, were used. Uh, uh, other few cases where the uh, uh, single stent strategy is also holding quite well. Uh, so it's, it's very individual, it depends on the coronary anatomy, the distribution of the vessel, the area subserved by the branches. And based on that, you decide whether your stent is going to be two stent or a three stent strategy or a single stent strategy. Also, it can help you decide whether the stent should go from left main to 
circumflexes a little bit untraditional compared to most of us doing stenting from left main to LAD. So uh, I think I'll stop here, but uh, try to show you uh, a couple of cases uh, which were important. I mean, left alone, uh, the side branches were left alone with a single stain uh, coming a few months later with a critical narrowing. Uh, and then we had to do uh, delayed uh, sort of uh, culottes or uh, tap technique and stenting the side branch as well as main branch. Thank you indeed for your attention. Uh, thank you, Shirish, for your excellent lecture. Sorry, at the initiation, I was out of the internet because it was disconnected. It was really a fantastic lecture, very done, well done. And you have shown some beautiful cases. And not only that, you have also shown the importance of FFR in real life scenario. You have shown that the circumflex ostium, which was looking to be critically narrowed, and you showed by FFR, it showed to be 0.93. And you have put the wear in both the branches, in the parent circumflex as well as the OM branch. So beautiful demonstration of real life scenario. Excellent, excellent cases, Shiris. Very well done. Dr. Ferret, any uh, comments from your part? Please unmute. Yeah. Uh, also, Dr. Ferret, we owe you a lot because I think yeah. you are the one who came to our center at least two times and uh, yeah. uh, kept us driving on left main uh, bifurcation. Yeah. So thank you indeed. Uh, yeah. If you like the cases, today's cases, uh, yeah, the credit my goes to my to be, to be in your center and we have done really uh, fantastic cases together. Um, I think um, you show it um, a variety of different approaches. So you, we have, there is now only one way, you know, uh, I'm, I'm always thinking, okay, I have a plan A, my strategy, but you have to be on the other hand, flexible, you know, you start and you see something is not perfect and then you have to be flexible. And I think um, you should, so many different cases, and always with a really nice, uh, very good result. And what I um, believe it's, it's fantastic, uh, the option to postulate even with OPN balloons, non-compliant balloons, uh, to see with both boost, on, boost stand option or a clear stand option to see uh, very close uh, um, the, the struts, um, um, situation, how it looks, is there some deformation, whatever. And this, uh, I mentioned this before, we should use this approach in new X-ray machines, uh, Simmons or Philips, they have uh, already implemented all these um, um, options, um, functions, and we should use it this, uh, I think, more frequently. So thank you. I could always uh, learn also from, from the uh, whole session. Uh, so many important aspects. Uh, so in summary, from my point of view, uh, we, we saw there is a good, still, I think, reasonable good data for long-term follow-up for patients after uh, left main PCI who were initially not perfect candidates for cabbage. Uh, you, we saw there is um, a critical time after left main PCI is the first year. After the first year, according to our data, at least there was a very similar uh, result, uh, very similar uh, data for ne next nine years between single and double stenting. I think we have now more and more um, good uh, new generation stands. One of them is Onyx. We work a lot with them. And this allow us to uh, manage better um, just the left main stenosis. And I think uh, I, I could enjoy the presentation from Goran to show us very good um, in educational way uh, how important is uh, the, the, the pot how important is the knowledge from uh, animal studies? I personally was in February in, in this, um, in this um, cath lab and maybe next time I show you uh, um, the case of double culotte um, 
uh, double kissing collage technique, which I have done first time in, in uh, visible uh, lab in Minneapolis. So um, this is also a very educational case with uh, visual, uh, with a videoscopic view and with, um, with uh, OCT. So uh, I think the cases from, from uh, Fazila, fantastic. So congratulations. And I also was in your cath lab and really I have a great respect to to your job, what you have done in, in Bangladesh for your people. And I hope I they work again together and uh, as well, fantastic cases from, from um, Dr. Hiramat. So I also hope one day to, to come again to India and we stay in contact. Thank you to yes. Dr. Kahali to, for the invitation. Yeah, you have to come, yeah. <laughs> we need your advice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferenc. From NICCSI for being oh, with us for two and a half. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Fajila, Fajila, have you got uh, Ramesh? You are there. Yeah, I was looking for you, Ramesh. Uh, any yeah. final comments, Ramesh? I, I think it's a fantastic session. Dr. Hiramat and Dr. Fajila have shown like really great cases on how to, number one, uh, do a proper uh, PCI of left main. I think this is where the crucial point is, right? Whenever we want to do a study, we have to make sure that the operators are really very qualified, uh, that they can perform uh, rotoblation, they can perform high uh, complex PCI and take all the time that it takes to perform uh, to do these PCIs properly. Only then you can compare it with bypass surgery. But unfortunately, we don't get to choose the centers that actually uh, get nominated and uh, then the data is all a uh, mishap of uh, everything, right? You know, so um, we wish that there is a proper trial, but unfortunately we don't. But uh, even in the United States, we get all turned downs. I mean, we do let me PCIs quite a bit. The surgeons actually turn them down and give it to us uh, most of the time. So those patients uh, should not be counted towards uh, any of the uh, problems because they're already uh, surgical failures in the sense that that it could not be an option for them. So great uh, session, uh, Hirama. Thank you very much, and Fazila, thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, Ramesh, for your kind. And it's absolutely what Eugene Bronwald told in his editorial, that the operator should be very expert, experienced, and the team should also equally be experienced. That is very important in dealing with left main PCI. The arteries are big. Last time, uh, last week, as Maurice was commenting that Left main is a big artery, so I don't bother about it. That's true, but again, it supplies more than 70% of the ventricular mass, left ventricular mass, so it's a very important artery. Fajila, any final message? Because we are going to conclude soon. Thank you so Fajila. much for... Thank you so much for inviting me over. Today, I learned such a lot from three great authorities on left main. I'm very grateful, and I had a great time. Thank you so much. Thank you for your excellent work and fantastic lecture. Really, it was a fantastic lecture. And also your work, I, I know it, I have see, seen it several times. And again, I saw that it was a masterpiece of work. Thank you very Thank much, you. Fadila, for joining. And it was and for very being nice meeting all friends hours. and very kind yeah. words. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Thank that's you. right. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, important. Fadila. It was nice meeting so, all Dr. of Dotto, us. So, Dr. Dotto, you want to tell? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Fadila. Thank you. No, I, I, Dr. I Dotto, have... and if... I don't have much to talk about uh, because it was so beautifully demonstrated by him at a galaxy of uh, different types of uh, left main lesions. The only one thing is that I am slightly scared. Uh, doing a culotte is relatively safer in the sense that uh, particularly if the ang angle is narrow. But then we have increased metal, metal burden. The reason why SKS is not found to be very popular because again, it was a question of metal burden. So do you like to be concerned with uh, use metal burden, particularly if the left main is very not very large? Uh, well, yes. I mean, uh, if left main is not very large, I mean, always keep the overlap not too long. I mean, yeah. you may uh, overlap these stents uh, just for a few millimeters and still it will work like a kilo. Kind of modified. So the idea is not to have any uncovered area in that segment. So Culot does a very good job from that angle. 
If your left vein is short, uh, bring one stent all the way back to the ostium and keep the second stent uh, uh, just uh, at the bifurcation site. But if left vein is short, you always bring the stent uh, back to the ostium. So when you decide this, the first stent which goes in should be placed uh, at the bifurcation and the second stent should be kept at the ostium. If you keep the first stent at the ostium, then sometimes the second stent to go in may create problem. Your guide catheter and the alignment with the vessel may not be the best. So always put the distal stent first, which is going to be inflated at the bifurcation. I'm talking of kilops. Yeah, and yeah. then the second stent would come back all the way to the left vein arch. Thank you. Thank you, Shirish. And, and, and my, my salute and heartfelt gratitude and thanks to all the finest speakers that came from different parts of the globe. We are particularly grateful to Dr. Ferenc and Dr. Garwan for their excellent deliberations. It was a very good teaching lesson for all of us. And thanks the NCI National Council of Intervention for organizing the conference. Thank you, Timan Kahali in particular. Uh, thank you very much, Anjanda, Professor Dottu, for your excellent comments. And uh, thank you, everybody, because uh, we have been discussing for three hours almost, and especially to our foreign guest, Dr. Goran Stankovic, and my good friend, Dr. Ferenc Miroslav. So please uh, be with us in future also, and I invite you for our national virtual conference, of course, on 31st of October and 1st of November. So if you kindly book both the dates, and it is from 6.30 because it will be a little longer, three hours or three and a half hours. And thank you very much again for your excellent, fantastic lecture. Thank you, Ramesh, too. He has been constantly supporting the CSI NIC movement. And he's an excellent operator, Ramesh. You have been there all along. Shirish, excellent, beautiful cases. And Goran is not there. He has gone for the TCT Connect shoot. I also thank all the presenters, all the... Uh, faculties, all the attendees also, the participation was also very good because there are two platforms. What we see over here is participation is one platform and there is another platform. So uh, the, you know, attendee was also very good. Their participation was very good. I uh, give a lot of respect and honor to all of them for being with us for so long period. And lastly, but not the least, Metronics India was the sponsor of today's meeting. And I thank Shanjai, Jasmeet, and Anand, and everybody of their team, Shubho and Omit over here, for a fantastic job they have done. And I am very grateful to the, our foreign uh, participants, especially, especially Dr. Ferenc, Goran, Ramesh, and Fajilna Malik for their excellent participation. Thank you very, very much. And please accept the gratitude and the respect from CSI as a whole and CSI National Intervention Council, and we hope we'll be soon meeting together. Professor Dotto, thank you very, very much for your excellent comments. Thank, thank you very much. Fajila, have you left? And Fajila, you have you left? Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Th it was very nice meeting all of you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, yes. thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Meeting you after a long time. Hope to see you all in the thank future. You. Take care. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Great patience, and you thank remain you. as humble as ever, despite yeah, achieving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's a very special Thank you. college. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. you take care. Bye. And Bye. Shikish Bye. also. Bye. Yeah. Excellent Dr. cases. Kali. Excellent. Ramesh, thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Fazila. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.